Good morning, everyone. We're going to start our service this morning by singing one of the selections from the Justice Choir uh, songbook, which is a free online um, resource that we use from time to time. And it's uh, the people put together these songs and provide them to us. And some of them are in harmony and some of them aren't. It's a great, great, great place. Lisa turned me on to this, Lisa Maynard. And so you're invited to sing along quietly behind your masks. This is called Be the Change. sing the first verse through a couple of times. Be the change you want to see in the world. Be the change you want to see in the world. Be the change you want to see in the world. And change will come to you. One more time than that. Be the change you want to see in the world. Be the change you want to see in the world. Be the change you want to see in the world. And change will come to you. Be the voice you want to hear in the world. Be the voice you want to hear in the world. Be the voice you want to hear in the world. And change will come to you. Be the light you want to shine in the world. Be the light you want to shine in the world. Be the light you want to shine in the world. And change will come to you. My script just went away. I'm saving paper, but then sometimes my iPad does whatever it wants. Welcome to Westside Unitarian Universalist Congregation. I am Liz Bucklew, and it is my great joy to be gathering with you this day with member Jill Fleming. Scott Farrell is providing music along with John Hansen, Larry Jones, and Marion Key. Ellen Wanless is lighting our chalice today, and Ann Fox will be sharing our time for all ages. Henry Sikora and Nate Mesnard are tech experts bringing us all together in the sanctuary and virtually. And for the gifts of all these folks, we are grateful. It's a blessing to be able to worship together and to be here with all of you today. If you're with us for the first time 
for the first time in a while, welcome. We're so glad that you are here to share in this time, to make some space in your life, to attend to your heart and your spirit, and to come together in community. Please visit our website or scan the QR code in the pews to fill out a getting to know you welcome form so that we can send you our weekly electronic newsletter, The West Side Week. It's full of information about upcoming services and other activities. And we hope that you'll join us after the service for conversation and community. Catching up with everyone and seeing friendly faces on this warm August day. We gather together from many locations and we take this moment to particularly acknowledge that our congregation resides on the traditional territory of the Duwamish people. In this acknowledgement, we recognize the Duwamish heritage imbued in the mountains, valleys, waterways, and shorelines that surround us all. We, may we nurture our relationship with our coastal Salish neighbors, especially the Duwamish people, and our shared responsibilities to this place. Let us take a moment to offer humble respect for this place and its peoples, and renew our commitments to the work of authentic reconciliation. Whoever you are, wherever you have come from, Whatever the color of your skin, whoever and however you love, however your body moves or your brain works, however you identify, you are welcome in this faith community. Our Unitarian Universalist tradition has no test of faith, no creed or oath to swear. We instead have the promises we make to one another, commitments we bring to a hurting world, within and beyond our walls. Our guest speaker today is Jill Fleming. Jill is a longtime member of Westside. Over the years, she has served as board president. She's chaired various committees and sung in the choir. Every so often, she feels a sermon coming on and she appreciates being able to be in the pulpit. Jill retired in 2020 from Community Roots Housing, where she most recently served as deputy director. She and her husband, Steve Burroughs, have six adult children between them and six grandchildren. Welcome, Jill. Come into this place of peace and let its silence heal your spirit. Come into this place of memory and let its history warm your soul. Come into this place of prophecy and power and let its vision change your heart. One of the many gifts of community is friendship and fellowship. Let's take a few moments to greet those around you in whatever way feels right, a smile, a wave, an elbow bump.
good to see all those conversations going. Hopefully that'll continue after the service. In each week's service, we invite a member of our congregation to light the chalice of our shared Unitarian Universalist faith. Today, our chalice lighter is Ellen Wanless. You may know Ellen because she's been providing our lovely floral arrangements. <laughs> and there's a special treat today. She's brought a magnifying glass. So after the service, she invites you to come up here and take a really close look at those flowers because there's a special appreciation when you can see just the intricacy of nature. We're asking our chalice lighters to answer the question, what gives me hope? Ellen. Thank you, Liz. Um, very emotional. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, I used to have a lot of hope, um, hope based in my belief that the profound changes in the 1960s and 1970s would be developed and expanded upon. But the murder of George Floyd woke me up to some of the ugly realities here with us today. And I realized that the hope I'd had was false hope. So when Liz first invited me to light the chalice months ago, I told her that I could not because I have no hope. But this did not mean that I was full of despair. And so I asked myself, well, since I have no hope, what do I have? And I heard my inner voice say, joy. You can find joy every day. And that's what I set about doing. And I find joy in my dog, Miss Lola Pants. <laughs> who makes me laugh with delight and playfulness. I find joy in watching my husband, memorizing him actually, the depths of his eyes, the colors of the shirts he chooses to wear, the swing in his walk. I find joy in playing my guitar. I find joy in cracking wicked jokes that make my 90 plus year old clients laugh, in gently teasing them so that they don't feel so old and lost. Slowly, I have discovered so many things that give me joy. And to my surprise, I see that these joys have given me hope. I hope that the next evening and the next and the next, I'll play my guitar working a tune until it has seeped into my bones and I'm able to play its story. I hope that I'll see Bill again and again and we'll laugh and crack each other up with wicked jokes and I'll see his eyes sparkle with delight. I hope that I'll walk with Miss Lola Pants again tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. I hope that this congregation will continue to deliver the profound services I have come to depend upon. I hope that I'll get to go to the Delridge, South Delridge Farmers Market every second and fourth Saturday, a market run by the African Housing and Community Development Organization, where most of the farmers and vendors are black and brown, the produce is beautiful, the food delicious, the laughter in the air is tangible. I do not have hope that the world won't end due to climate change, that people won't stop killing each other with ARs, that enough people will wake up and vote to make a positive difference. But I do have hope now that each day I might be able to do something that brings me joy and gives joy to others. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. As Ellen lights our chalice, please join me in speaking the words of the congregation's affirmation. Love is the doctrine of this congregation. 
The quest for truth is our sacrament, and service is our prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve humanity in fellowship, thus do we covenant with one another. <sighs> so I feel like this song, um, please, please rise in body or spirit for our opening hymn, which is Answering the Call of Love. And um, just when Ellen was just speaking, it just, uh, just sort of touched me that, that that's one thing that we can all do individually is answer this call of love. And uh, this hymn was written by Jason Shelton in 2004 to honor the Reverend William Sinkford president of the Unitarian Universalist Association at the time, for his prophetic witness in being one of the leading voices of our movement in the marriage equality issue. So, and, and, and at this time, when those things feel like they could be threatened again, this is a time to, to hold on to this and get active and be powerful. Okay. As a reminder, we're encouraging you to sing quietly behind your masks. Thank you so much. will share the story Two for One Summer by Judith C. Campbell. The young and young at heart are invited to come forward to hear better. You can sit on the floor in front of Anne. Anyone who wants to hear better is Welcome to join any age. <laughs> this is a story from uh, excuse me. this is a story from You You and Me, the collected stories um, of the You You and Me uh, kids magazine. We're talking about um, the gifts of spiritual community, um, and to me, I think one of the greatest things about community and friendship is the opportunity to learn new things and think about things in a different way. 
Um, and so this is a story about uh, two children who meet at camp and do just that. Have you ever been to camp before? Yeah. Have you ever learned new things or made new friends? Yeah, pretty cool. Andy was the name taped to the last empty bunk in the cabin. Tony unpacked his stuff and wondered what his, I'm gonna take my mask off. <laughs> I forgot I could do that. <laughs> Tony unpacked his stuff and wondered what his bunkmate this year was going to be like. For the past two summers, Tony had earned a scholarship to go to Walden, an art and theater summer camp because of his outstanding artwork in school. Last year, his bunkmate, Drew, was a painter and they'd really hit it off. Hey, you must be Andy, Tony called out as a tall kid dressed in a heavy jacket walked into the cabin. Yeah, I am, answered Andy. Sorry I'm late. Well, I'm done with my stuff, said Tony. Want me to help you make your bunk? I can do it myself, snapped Andy. I don't need any help. Well, excuse me, said Tony. I was just asking. I didn't mean to make you mad or anything. Gee, I'm sorry, said Andy, right away. I'm just tired of people feeling sorry for me and always trying to help me. What's to feel sorry about, asked Tony. Tell me you don't notice anything different about me, said Andy. Well, you have a pretty heavy jacket on for July, but that's about all I can see that's different. It's this, said Andy, as he started to unzip his jacket. I was born with only half of my arm, so I don't have a left hand. There's a little nub that might have been a thumb or something at the end of it. I can move it a little, see? Tony wasn't sure he wanted to see. He'd never seen any that kind of thing before, and he was afraid he might say something wrong or look grossed out. But before he could do anything, Andy took off his jacket and pulled up his sleeve. Look, said Andy, wiggling the little nub at Tony. It's waving at you. <laughs> there was something about that moment. Maybe it was because Tony felt so uncomfortable. Whatever it was, Tony looked at the little wiggling nub on the end of Andy's arm, and he laughed out loud. Andy laughed, too, and when Tony wiggled his pinky finger back at Andy, they both laughed even harder. I think they like each other, said Andy and he started talking in a little high-pitched voice as if the nub on the end of his arm was talking to, Andy, to Tony's baby finger. <laughs> Tony picked right up on it, and the two of them talked back and forth in pretend voices as if they were putting on a puppet show. Hey, said Andy, you're good at this. Are you here for acting too? I'm on a drama scholarship. No, said Tony, I'm here on an art scholarship. I'm going to do pottery all week. I can't act for anything. I have such a rotten memory. I'd make a fool of myself. You sure could act when you were talking through your little finger, said Andy. Aw, oh, that was just kidding around. That wasn't acting. Sure it was. It's called improvisation. You make stuff up as you go along, and you're good at it. I bet you could act if you wanted to. Andy got quiet and looked down at his left arm. Not like me in pottery, he said. I've always thought of making stuff with clay would be cool, but no matter how much I want to, I could never make a pot on a potter's wheel. Don't be so sure about that, said Tony. I get this art magazine, and once I read about a guy who lost an arm in an accident, and he taught himself to use the potter's wheel with only one arm. If you want, I can try and show you how he did it. Okay, said Andy, but only if you try out for this week's play. Geez, said Tony, I don't know if I can memorize lines in one week. <laughs> I'll go over your lines with you, and you'll go over the clay with me, and we'll both do something we never dreamed of doing. And always dreaded, Tony mumbled. Andy, I'm afraid of getting up in front of people. Do you really think I can do it? Oh, do you really think I can learn to use the potter's wheel? Okay, I get it, said Tony. If you're willing to try, so am I. The two new friends worked together all that week. First, Tony had to teach himself how to throw a pot one-handed, and it wasn't easy. Clay flew off the wheel and hit the wall. One hunk even hit Andy in the stomach. By the end of the first session, the two of them looked like mud pies with legs and great big smiles. Tony did manage to get one little piece of clay to stay on the wheel and actually look like a pot. He found that if he put his left hand in his back pocket, it helped the rest of his body get the right pressure on the clay. I think I've got it, said Tony. Next time, you'll try. 
The next day, after they got the wheel going with the clay on it, Tony said, just put your hand on mine so you can feel what's happening. It's wiggling all over the place, giggled Andy. How do you get it to settle down? That's the hardest part, Tony answered, as he put pressure in just the right place on the center of the clay. When it was centered, Tony took the clay off the wheel and threw it back down again. Now, let's try with your hand on the bottom, said Tony. Andy put his hand on the wet clay, and with a little help from Tony's hand on top, they got the clay ball centered. I can't believe it, said Andy. Will you look at this? Well, it's not a pot yet, but I bet by tomorrow it will be. You really caught on fast. Now what about my acting lesson? Tonight is the tryout. It was almost as if each boy got two weeks for one that summer. Andy was learning to do something he'd always dreamed of and never thought was possible. And Tony was learning to memorize lines and speak in front of people, something he had always been afraid to do. On the last day, Tony had managed to memorize lines for his small part, but he was still practicing them as he guided Andy through making one more pot to take home to show his parents. The two boys were working so hard, they never heard Billy and Chuck come in through the door. Wow, will you look at that, exclaimed Chuck. So that's how you do it. Do what, said Tony and Andy, almost together. That pot, said Chuck. That's why I could never get it right. I've always been using two hands. Nobody ever told me I was only supposed to use one. Tony and Andy looked at each other and started laughing so hard they couldn't catch their breath. What's so funny, asked Chuck. What did I say? Should we tell them, asked Andy. It's your pot, Andy, said Tony. You show them how it's done. Thank you, Anne. Our RE program is on summer break, so kids are invited to remain in the service today. Let's sing our children back to their families with As You Go. In a moment, we will engage in a collective act of generosity known as our offering, when we take the time to actively support Westside UU and its many ministries with our gifts by text or by check. Each month, we choose a community organization to share one third of our undesignated offering gifts. That is, those donations not designated as your pledge contributions. For the month of August, our community giving recipient is the White Center Food Bank. The mission of the White Center Food Bank is to minimize hunger while nourishing community, nurturing self-reliance, and embracing our rich cultural diversity. Begun in the mid-1970s as an emergency response to assist struggling families and individuals in the greater White Center and Highline areas, this community organization was incorporated in 1982 and in 2021 served 83,702 individuals. Current programs include daytime and seniors only food distributions, expanded home deliveries, mobile food bank program for seniors and disabled clients, a baby pantry for diapers, formula, baby foods and more, culturally relevant food grown on site, and in community demonstration, gardens and pea patches. Intake services are provided in seven languages and all written materials are provided in six languages. You can give by text, by sending a message with a dollar sign in the amount you wanna to give to 616-404-4171. If you need to update, update your payment information, you can text UPDATE to that same number. And for folks who are in the sanctuary and prefer to share your gifts by cash or check, 
the greeters will move among us to collect your giving. If you'd like your gift to be recorded as coming from you, please use one of the envelopes in the pew. And please enjoy this centering music from our musicians. Thank you to everyone for giving as you're able to support Westside and the White Center Food Bank. Your generosity of time, treasure, and presence are gifts that sustain us as a community. Join me in this meditation. This, the words were written by Rebe Rebecca Parker. In the midst of a world. In the midst of a world marked by tragedy and beauty, there must be those who bear witness against unnecessary destruction and who with faith rise and lead in freedom with grace and power. There must be those who speak honestly and do not avoid seeing what must be seen of sorrow and outrage or tenderness and wonder. There must be those whose grief troubles the water while their voices sing and speak refreshed worlds. There must be those whose exuberance rises with lovely energy that articulates Earth's joys. There must be those who are restless for respectful and loving companionship among human beings, whose presence invites people to be themselves without fear. There must be those who gather with the congregation of remembrance and compassion, draw water from old wells, and walk the simple path of love for neighbor. And there must be communities of people who seek to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God, who call on the strength of soul force to heal, transform, and bless life. There must be religious witness. On Sunday morning, we come together as a congregation to connect and share that which matters most to us, 
At this time, we make collective space for holding our joys and sorrows. It is the tradition of our congregation to honor the joys and sorrows of our members and friends, neighbors and loved ones on the first Sunday of each month that we are together with a candle lighting ritual. So as we get this in place, I will now invite folks in the sanctuary to come forward and light a candle. Please come down the side aisles and return using the center aisle. Members and friends online, please join us in lighting a candle or chalice in your own home too. We mark a moment of silence and followed by music 
holding in the tender vessel of our loving care all the joys and sorrows, both known and unknown, of our beloved community. When Jill told me that she was using this book, Search, as her inspiration for the service, I was excited. I had purchased this novel months ago, and it had been languishing on my nightstand. Now I felt compelled to read it, and I really enjoyed it. Unitarian Universalists aren't often represented on the page or the screen, so I loved reading about familiar hymns, sources, and rituals of our faith. The author documents her year on a search team, and I had the honor of serving in the same capacity for our congregation. We called ourselves the MST-19, Ministerial Search Team of 2019, and we met regularly for 13 months as one of my best ever church experiences. My love for the six other members of the team, for our denomination, and most importantly, my love deepened for Westside. The responsibility of representing WSEU and our beloved community was holy work. And all around, I see how many of us care for our congregation in so many ways. From the board of trustees, committee members, and religious education teachers, to volunteer gardeners, building maintenance, musicians, and greeters. There's so much care in this community. As I read the book Search, I was grateful to be reminded of all these precious connections that we share. And spending time together in worship and in service deepens that network. My relationship with Jill is nurtured as we sing together in the choir, and we volunteer together each month at the White Center Food Bank. Anne and I bonded during our time together teaching middle school OWL and growing together in the Beloved Conversations program. Like the new friends in our children's story today, we have so many gifts to offer each other in our spiritual community. Thank you.
In uh, planning our services, I always ask the speaker for the week for requests or suggestions for hymns that they feel might resonate with their sermon theme. One of the hymns that Jill suggested this week was We'll Build a Land. And after I made the decision to include it as the anthem for this week, I listened to some versions, some different versions, including a choral adaptation by Mark Miller. And um, since a lot of them had reworked the melody and played with the words a couple of places, I felt some freedom in doing the same thing. So, so, so I played around with it just a little bit, so you may notice some slight melodic changes from what you may be used to. So I invite you to, to sing along if you'd like, but also just to maybe resonate, just let the, let the words really resonate with you from what this song actually says. Thank you. We'll build a land where we bind up the broken. We'll build a land where the captives go free. Where the oil of gladness dissolves all mourning. Oh, we'll build a promised land that can be. Come build a land where people together, empowered by love, may then create peace, where justice shall roll. And peace like an ever flowing stream. We'll build a land where we bring the good tidings to all the afflicted and all those who mourn. And we'll give them garlands. Instead of ashes, oh, we'll build a land where peace is born. Come build a land where people together, empowered by love, may then create Justice shall roll down like the waters, and peace like an ever-flowing stream. We'll build a land, building up ancient cities, raising up from old, restoring old ruins of generations. Oh, we'll build a land of people so Empowered by love, may then create peace where justice shall roll down like the waters and peace like an ever flowing stream. Come, build a the mantles of praises resound from spirits once faint and once weak, where like oaks 
of righteousness stand her people. Oh, we'll build the land, my people, we see. Empowered by love, may then create peace where justice shall roll down like the waters and peace like a As Liz said, the inspiration for this sermon came as I read the novel search by Michelle Hunovan. So now at least two copies have been sold in this congregation. <laughs> search is the story of the year-long search for a new minister at the fictional Arroyo Unitarian Universalist Community Church, affectionately referred to as AUC by its members. If you are new to Unitarian Universalism, each congregation calls or selects its ministers directly through a prescribed process or search. The novel is the story of the Ox Search Committee, who in true UU fashion spend a year together, meeting week in and week out, almost always with food. The book has recipes. Working through the search process, ending in the candidating week and the congregational vote. Let me stop right here and say this is not going to be a book report sermon. Over the years, I've heard my share of sermons based on a single book, and I am not usually a fan. But this book did launch me on the road to today's sermon. So how did I arrive at my topic today, the gifts of a spiritual community? The story of Search is told through the eyes of Dana Potowski, a 50-ish longtime member of AUK. Beyond the often very entertaining accounts of the committee members, their deliberations, and the stories of the minister candidates, what I was most drawn to was Dana's reflections on her own spiritual journey what had drawn her to Auk, and Unitarian Universalist, and what had been most meaningful to her in her 20 plus years as a member. This prompted me to reflect on my life as a Unitarian Universalist and my almost 30 years as a member of this congregation. These last seven to eight years have been hard for us as a congregation. I know it has been hard for me, and I am now just beginning to feel less cranky about it. <laughs> we had a difficult interim ministry period after the retirement of Reverend Peg Morgan with not one, but two different interim ministers plus a bridge minister. We had two ministerial searches of our own, one that ended without a minister. Our chosen minister's arrival was delayed due to immigration matters, and that delay meant that COVID had struck before he arrived, and now that ministry has ended. This doesn't even begin to address all the societal and denominational changes with respect to race and white supremacy that were and are occurring. With all this in the background, I found it hard at times to remember the good things about being a member all the gifts I had received from being part of this spiritual community, this congregation. So reading Search, and I read it twice, was a welcome opportunity to reflect on my life as a UU and especially as a member of Westside. It also helped that COVID was not part of the novel storyline. Early in 
the novel, Dina is remembering a conversation she had with the Auk minister when she was considering whether she might go back to school and become a minister. He asks her, what does a church give its members? She answers, church is the one place I know that privileges the soul, that focuses on spiritual values and bases a community on them. Church gives me more capacious and compassionate ways to think about my life and the world and it provides opportunities to be of service to others. I think that is a good starting point as an answer. Church, the spiritual community, is the one place that privileges the soul. It is the place where you sit down at a potluck and almost immediately are in deep conversation about whether God exists or what happens after death. It is the place where you are not embarrassed to have these conversations. And this kind of church is not limited to Sunday morning, but can happen anywhere we gather together. Today, I want to share several gifts I have received during my almost 30 years as a Westside member with the hope that you will receive or have already received similar gifts because of your participation in the Westside community. The first gift I received quite early on in my membership at Westside was a sermon that changed my mind. Back then, we were still meeting in the basement of the Masonic Temple. We weren't even meeting upstairs there yet. I do not recall what year it was, but it was at a time when we did not have a regular minister, not even a quarter time once a month minister. We heard from an ever-changing cast of supply, member, supply ministers, members, and community members on Sunday morning. One Sunday, we heard from a local woman whose brother had been murdered in White Center. It was not a sensational murder that garnered a lot of media attention, but it was a murder nonetheless, and the police apprehended a suspect. I no longer remember the text of the sermon, but she spoke strongly about opposing the death penalty and how she, the victim's sister, would not support the prosecutor's desire to go for the death penalty for the suspect. She did not want to be party to another life being taken. I came away from that sermon solidly against the death penalty. And this is consistent with our universalist theology that all are saved. I was raised in a UU church that was strongly Unitarian, so it took me some time to realize this. To this day, I cannot think of a sermon that had a bigger impact on me. So my first hope for all of us is that at some time we experience a sermon that changes your mind or opens your heart or causes you to consider another point of view. Actually, I hope you experience many of them. The second gift was participating in social action that taught me deeper compassion. Westside was part of Family Promise, a coalition of churches that provided overnight shelter for homeless families and homeless women. Several times a year, Westside members would host them, first in other West Seattle churches before we had our own building, and later in this building. The families would go to a day center or school or work during the day and then were brought back to the church before dinner time. The congregation provided dinner, some informal supervision of the children after dinner, and conversation with the adults as desired. The families slept in the religious education classrooms overnight along with two volunteers from the congregation. In the morning, the volunteers would get everyone up, host a simple breakfast, and the families were picked up by van and taken to the day center. My husband Steve and I volunteered a number of times as the overnight volunteers. Quite frankly, we thought it would be easier to do this than cooking for a group. And we did not have any constraints that prevented us from being away from home overnight. We made sure that everyone retired to their rooms at the designated time 
secured the building, and turned out the lights. We slept in our sleeping bags on an air mattress in a Sunday school room, just like the family promised families. But the difference was, we got to go home in the morning, to our own home, to our own shower, and a real bed. The families in the other rooms had no home. I do not claim to know how it feels to be truly homeless, but being present with the family promised families gave me a whole new way of seeing them and empathizing with them. I hope that we as a congregation can again do work such as this that makes a difference as we regroup from COVID and our other transitions. Another gift I received from Westside was when the unthinkable happened. My first husband, Bill Freeberg, and I joined Westside in 1994 with our three children. Bill and I were both active in the work of the congregation, including serving on the board at various times. In 2005, Bill was on the board when he underwent surgery for liver cancer. Within a few days, he slipped into a coma, and after a month, we made the decision, supported by Reverend Pegg, um, to end life support. He died October 22, 2005. During his hospitalization, Westside members brought us food, came to the hospital, donated blood, and were kind and supportive in every imaginable way. We were truly held in a circle of love, both during and after this extremely hard time. I know the love and care of this congregation meant a great deal to Bill's extended family as well. Our flaming chalice stained glass window at the entrance of, was purchased with donations from his mostly Catholic relatives. Illness and death are part of the human condition, but we do not have to be alone as we experience them. Westside is a caring community that supports and cares for its members. While I do not wish hard times on anyone, I do hope that Westside can support each of us when they occur. Another gift was the opportunity to accomplish something extraordinary. Westside was founded in 1963. During the early years, West Seattle Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, our original name, owned and met in a house behind what is now the Admiral's Starbucks. The fellowship had some challenging times in the early 70s and the house was sold, the $10,000 profit banked for the future. Fast forward to the mid 90s when the fellowship started to grow again. As we grew in membership, we met in the Masonic Temple off Alaska Street first in the basement twice a month, eventually using all three floors and meeting every Sunday. Our ministry moved from a quarter time to half time to full time minister as our membership grew. Much as we had a cordial relationship with the Masons, we needed our own building. By 2009, we had a large committee working on finding a building and in early November 2009, we found one, this building. Even in the middle of the Great Recession, real estate in West Seattle was expensive. The combination of another congregation downsizing and a lender in trouble with the FDIC allowed us to purchase the property for 30% less than market value. But we needed to raise money quickly. The experts said it could not be done. We had no experience raising that kind of money. In just six months, we raised over 400,000 in a capital campaign that eventually totaled 650,000, and we secured mortgage loans totaling 612,500 to be exact. We closed on the property on April 10th, uh, April 15th, 2010. But that was not all. Over the spring and summer months, a whole crew of volunteers painted, cleaned, and supervised necessary repairs to ready the building for our first Sunday service that September. I think back on that time, and I remember the unity of effort, the imperative of action, 
the feeling that we were accomplishing the impossible. We all gave so much of ourselves, both time and money. We knew that by having a physical home, we could do much more as a congregation. Congregations do ebb and flow over the years. These last few years of COVID, ministerial transition and denominational change and conflict have been hard. But we are a resilient bunch, and I think we can repair, renew, and move forward, and yet again do amazing, if not extraordinary things as a congregation. Whether it is making the building fully accessible, creating and executing much needed social action and social justice programs, or reinventing our re religious education programs, there is much we can do together that we cannot do alone. I have received many gifts as a member that I am allowed, if not encouraged, to explore my own theology and share it with you from this pulpit is a gift. Westside began as a lay-led fellowship, dependent on its members to plan the services and often fill the pulpit. Because of this history, Westside has long been more open to members leading our Sunday services and taking on the challenge of writing and giving sermons. Our UU principles affirm, in part, acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations and a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. This free and responsible search for Truth and meaning is my favorite UU principle. Not all of us are called to speak on Sunday morning, but we can all pursue a free and responsible search for truth and meaning in the supportive environment of this congregation. I continue to read and search for meaning in my own life, and I do that better being part of this spiritual community. I welcome the return to in-person Sunday services that engage my whole self. And I need to be with people despite the coziness of Sunday at home. For these gifts I have received from this congregation, both those elaborated here and many others, I am profoundly grateful. I would have had a much different life if I had not been part of Westside. I close by speaking from my vantage point as an, a near elder and longtime member of Westside. And I say to you, embrace this spiritual community, do what needs to be done, and receive what it has to offer. Blessed be. Thanks so much, Jill. I know it was great for me to hear actually that whole laid out history. It's like there's so much wealth here in, in experience and, um, and shared experience that I think I really believe that we, are, we can pull together and move forward. I just believe it. It's, yeah. so, so I invite you now to please rise in body or spirit for our sending hymn, which is 1021 Lean on Me. And, uh, this well-known hit song was written and performed by Bill Withers on his 1972 album, Still Bill. <laughs> I feel like I should have one of those. Withers' uh, difficult childhood in the coal mining town of Slab Folk, uh, West Virginia, was inspiration for the Lean on Me. It was written after he had moved to Los Angeles and found himself missing the strong community ethic of his hometown. It was Withers' first and only Billboard Hot 100 number one single. Again, we encourage you to move your body and sing along softly behind your mask.
Thank you, Scott and John and Larry and Marion for bringing our time together this week to an end. Deep thanks to everyone who participated in this service, most especially Jill Fleming, Anne Fox, and Ellen Wanless. As always, it's a pleasure and a blessing to do this sacred work together. Members, make sure to look at your wet side week, which you should have received on Friday for details about upcoming activities. Today, we invite you to stay after the service and mingle, either here in the sanctuary or downstairs in the social hall. Coming up this week, there's a General Assembly debrief Q&A Zoom session on Wednesday, August 24th at 7 p.m. with Westside GA Delegate Carrie Schur. And mark your calendars for WSU's beloved Community Cafe on Sunday, September 18th, as we kick off the effort to, to put out, to, oh, sorry, to put our newly adopted eighth principle into action here at Westside, again, September 18th, and we'll be hearing more as that approaches. Next Sunday, there's no service, but in two weeks, on August 28th, the Reverend Crystal Zerfoss will be our guest. As Ellen releases our flame, the blessing of truth be upon us, the power of love direct us and sustain us, and may the peace of this community preserve our going out and our coming in from this time forth until we meet again. May you go into this week Blessed and blessing the world, we hold you in our love as you go.